Well, all right, it is 5 o'clock. Five's the time, 5 o'clock's the time we all get to it. Uh, last week we ended off, uh, we were talking about the Holy Spirit and how what the Holy Spirit's role is in our Bible studies. And uh, one of the things we, we kind of hit on last week was the idea that the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a correct Bible study. So in other words, you still have to kind of uh, put forth effort <laughs> in your Bible study. You don't just open up your Bible and, oh, the Holy Spirit is going to do all the work for you. Uh, that, that's, that's something that doesn't really doesn't really happen. Um, you can have people who are spirit-filled, and still you have to study the Bible. You know, um, the, the, the Holy Spirit also doesn't change uh, the Bible to fit our circumstances. What we do is we read a section of the Bible, and we'll instantly put everybody in the blocks. You know what I mean? Like, let's say, for instance, we're reading about. Uh, you know, the Israelites defeating this enemy, and we think, ah, that enemy is that person that I don't like, and I'm Israel, and ah, well, it's not always that, you know, it uh, doesn't always have that same carryover. Uh, and so you really have to be careful that you aren't just kind of uh, changing the Bible to fit your specific circumstance. Instead, you're kind of trying to learn from it, you're adapting to it, that kind of stuff. Um, the Holy Spirit will, however, uh, help us to apply the Bible to our lives. Um, he he definitely will do that, and he is a part. It is this is a part of our uh, what's the term that was used uh, about 20 years ago? It's still used, but not as not as frequently. Uh, sanctification uh, is still a part of our sanctification. The more that God works in us, uh, the more that this the Holy Spirit works in us. The more that we change, the more that all that. So that's kind of a process. Um, but the really the the we we covered mo- a lot of this kind of in in, in theory at least uh, last week so I don't really want to drag drag too much of that, um, but uh, whenever you are in Bible studies the thing is is that your maturity will bring further clarity to the Bible, so in other words so you have to grow in your Bible uh, you have to grow a, as a Christian for some parts of the Bible for you to be kind of ready for if that kind of makes sense. Um, so let me say it like this. When you have a lot of zeal, you know, you're real uh, enthusiastic, but you don't really have anything to base you down on, you kind of just jerk Scripture out of context and just kind of run wild with it. You don't know how many times I've seen young Christians who, are, who have a lot of zeal for God, and they read something, and they just go to town with it. I'll give you a really quick example. So many teenagers that I talk to who are dealing with addictive behaviors— will then go and read a part in the Bible and they'll become everybody else's judge. You should stop doing this. You're a sinner. You need to stop doing this. And, and so they, they're masters at, at, at criticizing and condemning everybody else. But they themselves are stuck in addictive behavior. I see this happen all the time with young, with young men especially. I mean, I know it happens to women too, but I really see it a lot with young men, um, especially as it applies to pornography. You know, okay, so I, it's okay that I'm doing this because it's a victimless crime. And then I can go and say, well, you're gay, so you need to quit that. And you're, you're doing this, and so you need to quit that. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of zeal there, a lot of zeal there. But unfortunately, that zeal is not met with maturity. It's not met with, um, what's another word? Uh, discipline, yes. Is that what I have on the screen? Oh, yeah, that's a good word. That's a good word. <laughs> man, oh, man, Todd, you're taking a strip from my brain, Yes. Uh, and so, yes, it's good to have zeal. But was, and here's what happens. A lot of times when we read the Bible, we get more disciplined and we get more mature, but we lose the zeal. So it's like when we're younger, we have the zeal for the Bible, but we don't have anything to ground us down. When we're older, we're grounded in the Bible, but we, we lose the zeal for it. It doesn't really have anything uh, new for us, and that's obviously not an area we want to be in. Um, and the last thing I want to say about this before we go to the, to the application from last week because I don't want to spend too much time on last week's lesson, because that would mean we won't finish tonight. And when th- we have tonight and next week, so we really got to, you know, uh, get to it. Uh, the last thing I want to say about uh, this section is that you don't always have to do a in- real in-depth Bible study every single time that you read the Bible. Okay, there, there's sometimes when you can just go to the Bible, and you can just read it and think about it. Again, it's called meditating. You're just thinking on the Bible. You're not thinking about your problems. You're not thinking about the things that are concerning you. You're just kind of soaking in Scripture, and that's totally fine. You don't have to do this in-depth process every single time you read the Bible. It's just none of that, but you're going to have some times when you don't have time for that. You know, like you're writing to work, and you have a couple minutes, but you want to listen to the Bible, but you can't just, like, <laughs> make this whole long ordeal about it. And that's okay. So I don't feel like you're somehow, you know, uh, 
uh, sacrilege if you do that. And then the last thing I wanted to go from last last week's lesson was uh, a few things about applying more more broadly. So you'll remember the four steps of the interpretive journey, then and there, measuring the river, the principal bridge, and here and now. So those are four stages. So a lot of what we looked at thus far has mostly been step one, a little bit step two and three. Well, let's kind of take a quick look at step four, and then we can go to the, the New Testament more broadly. Um, Duvall and Hayes told the story uh, in their book, Grasping God's Word, about this, um, this, th this, just this man there that had memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. And if you just gave him the reference, he could... This man was an atheist. He had the entire Old Testament memorized. And he was an atheist. You know, uh, the, the, the idea here that I'm trying to get across is that it's not enough to know a lot. Okay, you, you can know all kinds of th things. Uh, there's encyclopedias that have all kinds of knowledge in them. <laughs> and that's, that's good, but it's really not enough. Um, th there has to be a point when you, when you cross a, 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 a line. And that line is this. You have to go past knowing how to apply the Bible to actually applying the Bible. So instead of just reading Ephesians 4 where it says um, about anger, it says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Okay, you can know all of that. There's no that about that. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, you have to apply that. So here I am with my spouse. We got in a fight. And it's totally their fault. And they need to, well, actually, you need to make sure the sun doesn't go down on your wrath. So you need to go back and you need to fix that. Whatever it takes you all need to come back together as a married couple. You can't allow chinks in the armor of your marriage. That's a really great application of, of that. Because here's the thing. Um, there's a f well, first off, yes, even you would cheat. It, it, anybody, anybody could cheat. Like, don't get it in your head that, no, I'm above temptation. No, anybody can cheat. Anybody can mess up. Anybody can, can get into sin. There's not good Christians and then, you know, bad Christians. There's Christians. <laughs> and Christians are sinners just like the world. So you've got to take the Bible and then actually apply it. It's not just knowing how to apply it. And, and we, we get a lot into head knowledge without actually follow through, which is not a great area to be in, but uh, I guess we all kind of are prone to it. And so you have to kind of cross the line between choosing to obey when you don't want to and choosing to believe when you doubt. And as you go through that, it kind of helps you uh, take the Bible and really absorb it. So uh, just a few more things with this. Uh, there are three basic steps for step four. <laughs> so step four was the here and now, applying it to us now and all that, okay? The th that can be broken up into the three uh, rougher steps. Step one, uh, how do the principles address the original situation? Step two, what is a parallel modern situation? And step three, be very specific. So let's kind of break that down. Step one is principles. Um, how do the principles address the original situation? So for that, you want to read the passage, and you want to break it down into elements, like element one, element two, element three. And those elements can be something like this, okay? Let's say you're reading Philippians 4, 13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay. So element one, Paul is a Christian. Element two, Paul is a Christian who's going through uh, a lot of struggles and trials. Uh, for the sake of Christ. Not just he's having a hard day at the gym. These are, you know, <laughs> his walk, <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing that he's going through. So that would be two examples of elements from that story. And so then you would go to step two where it's find parallel modern situations. Okay, so I am a Christian as well. I'm also going through struggles in my faith or with the church or, you know, as I'm growing spiritually. And... Uh, that's kind of how you do it, but th th there's a kind of a big danger zone here. Danger zone uh, here, and that's uh, sometimes we find superficial connections that aren't really there, and we kind of hop the gun. Like, okay, I'm going to read, um, Philipp this is a great example that I just used at Philippians 4.13, and I'm going to say, okay, so I could do all things through Christ. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rise to the occasion. I'm going to become a world-class athlete because I can do all things through Christ who saves me. Well, that's more motivational, but that's not really what was intended. You know what I mean? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to get this, uh, this, this world uh, record. 
because I can do all things. Well, that's not really what it's talking about. That's not really what it's talking about. Now let's kind of flip that. Okay. Uh, I am a single mom. My husband left me. I have all this debt. I have to raise the kids. I'm in a pickle. I have no idea to get out, how to get out of it. This really stinks. And uh, all this could have been avoided if I would have just not made God a big deal. If I would have just let it go, my husband would have stayed here, and he would have kept providing. So that's a good example. We have a Christian struggling in situations with her faith because of that. It's, that's, a good, that's a good carryover. Yes, she can do all things through Christ who saves her. That's not the end of the way that that would apply to her life, but it would be the beginning. Um, so think of another example would be Joshua chapter 1. Moses dies, and Joshua is getting ready to lead the, lead the people of Israel into a new land. So then we read it, and without going through the proper you know, uh, steps, we say, okay, well, uh, this applies to uh, my fight with my uh, mom and dad. Well, not not really. <laughs> um, not not really. I mean, you're just kind of taking it out of context. So you have to go, go to those three steps, okay? You're, you're trying to apply it. Step one, how do, how do the principles address the situation? How do the principles address the original situation? Break those into those, into those elements. And then step two, what is a parallel modern situation? Make sure that the elements here match the elements there. Like I don't gave you the example of Philippians 4.13. He was a Christian. I'm a Christian. He's suffering for the sake of Christ. Am I suffering for the sake of Christ? Because sometimes we get ourselves into a pickle. <laughs> And uh, we want to play the victim, but we got ourselves into the situation. And unless we change, we'll stay in that situation. And uh, well, and then the third step would be specific. So, so what should you think or do in this situation? Very specifically, how does this passage apply to this situation? Not how could it hypothetically apply? How does it apply? And uh, so those are kind of, um, I wish we had more time to go through that. Uh, but we really have to get going into tonight's lesson, <laughs> which is um, we're going to look at the New Testament kind of section by section. Um, and so now that we've kind of spent 15 minutes clarifying all those things, were there any questions from last week? Because I really blew through <laughs> blew through that last week, and I still didn't even get uh, to finish. So any questions? Sorry, I wasn't overly clear tonight. <laughs> Okay, so that takes us to uh, the fifth lesson. Um, the New Testament can be broken up into a few sections, just like the Old Testament can. And the first of those sections is called the epistles or the letters. It's the same thing. It means the same thing. Uh, and the the river of difference, remember the for, the interpretive journey, the, the, you have to measure the width of the river, how, how separate are we from them. So the river between us and the letters are fairly fairly small. Uh, you know, they're a New Testament church, we're a New Testament church. But they're going to go through first century problems, and we're going to go through 21st century problems. <laughs> but, you know, it is going to have a lot of carryover. It's just that you have to be aware that that was written to a specific situation, and I'm in another specific situation. So uh, the letters of the New Testament are longer than most ancient letters. Um, not all ancient letters. There are obviously some that are longer, but typically, by and large, um, the letters that we have in the New Testament are much longer. Uh, they range from formal to inform informal. So the book of Hebrews would be an example of a formal formal letter. It's, it's ver written in very uh, high Greek. Uh, and then uh, an example of informal would be more like Philemon, which is more written um, uh, casually to a guy in a church well, and to the church at large, but mostly to this guy in the church uh, who had a slave. And so you kind of have this, this it, it feels more of like a... Just the way it's written has more of a uh, not so way of being. Does that kind of make sense? Like it's uh, it, it's like the difference between a business letter and a personal letter. Uh, uh, kind of yeah. uh, and so it, it, letters just like really just like today they carried authority, you know, of the person who was writing. Um, and obviously this brings up the question: How do we know that it actually came from them? Well, uh, there's a lot of good reasons. First off, they had personal marks in the letters. And we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but uh, this is called auto, uh, autographs. So Paul would oftentimes, he wouldn't necessarily write the whole letter by hand, but towards the end he would make a mark and say, this is, my, this is the mark of my seal. And he would make his little, 
his little thing there. Uh, and he would do that with his own hand. That was a way that he showed that, yes, this was I, I'm, I wasn't the one writing it down on the paper, but yes, I am here and we're, we're, we're writing this together. Um, another thing is uh, they had tra- they did have a a a, a kind of like a post office kind of thing, but it really wasn't for common people. It was more for um, uh, government things. So obviously this wouldn't really qualify for that. Uh, but they did have trusted deliverers. So you know, like let's say, okay, me and Terry write this song. I mean, sorry, not the song, this letter. And I'm going to trust Shane to deliver it. So he's going to go walk it over there and hand it in personally. And then it's going to say in the letter, uh, I'm sending Shane with this letter, and he's going to greet all of you. Well, that's a good example of yes, it was you know trusted people. Um, and then also you have the issue that um, the the biblical uh, books were very widely spread. So uh, as as the church kind of expanded, there were fake letters that got into circulation. There were false gospels and false letters. Yes, that did happen. But they, they didn't ever get circulated in wide degree. They were more regional. And the, the content of the letters was very obviously not written by, you know, somebody of authority. Um, Gospel of Thomas is a great example of that. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of talk of it and people get all... Oh, the Gospel of Thomas, it's the missing gospel. No, it really isn't. Like, if you read the thing, you can know it's pretty nonsensical. Um, but anyways, uh, so the, the letters were written to address specific situations. Um, this is how you can uh, get into a, a, a letter and take something out of context. Like, uh, Paul writes in one of them, I want to say it's Colossians, but I might be wrong. He says something along the lines of how all things are permissible. Um, or all things are clean, or something like that. For, for the for the righteous, all things are clean. But for um, I forget how he words it. But for people who aren't righteous, everything is 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 wrong. And out of context, that makes it sound like, hey, I can do whatever, and you can't judge me because all things are lawful for me. But when you understand what the context is of the letter, it's like, oh, that he's more talking against the legalism, where they're trying to say, hey, if you do follow all these Jewish ideas of washings then that's going to, you know, make you more holy, more Christian. And he's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't, you don't have to go through all these washings and all these religious ritual thing with Bob's because the, the, for, for us who are righteous, we're already clean. Like, everything's clean. It's, it's not something we have to worry about anymore. But it, once again, if you're not aware of the context, well, that sounds a lot different. So uh, another thing is... Uh, Uh, in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul comes off kind of hot. <laughs> like he's uh, real, uh, and obviously he's younger in that book than he was in the other ones, but uh, he comes off kind of um, just flying out the door. You know what I mean? Like he's <laughs> he's got his thing, he's like a young guy does, you know. He's got his, <laughs> his, his things that he wants to talk about, this is pressing for him, and he calls them, if somebody says this thing, let them be cursed, let them, you know... Uh, He's really coming with strong language. But then you get to a book like uh, Corinthians, and it's obviously not talking about legalism. It's obviously talking about there's just a lot of disorder going on. Like there's people over here who are following the spirit or something, and they're just, everything's chaotic at the church. It's just not, everything's, woo, you, got a, you got some weirdos over here that are taking things too far. Uh, you know, just all these different things happening. So he's just kind of trying to bring order to it. And so it's a lot different of a feel. And once again, it's because they were written for two different reasons. Um, the letters were written very carefully and intentionally. Um, they were not written usually by one single person. They were usually re- written by uh, a couple people. Um, even the letters of Paul weren't written just by Paul. Um, if you read through there, he'll, he'll kind of usually mention some of the others who are with him. And uh, so it's not like um, you, you've got this one, one guy who's, who's making up Christian doctrine. You've got this guy who's a church leader writing with other church leaders, and the church is aware of these documents. It's, <laughs> and then they're protecting the documents as they, you know, uh, age. Um, so you, you know, you, you got a lot of a lot of wrong ideas about the Bible from and the culture nowadays. But um, <clears throat> when we're reading the letters, we can be sure to pay attention to the specific words being used because they were written with specific words uh, in mind. Um, they usually had some some form of a secretary that, that wrote it, um, and co-senders, I already mentioned that. 
the letters were written specifically to be read aloud, and there's uh, numerous reasons why they were written like that. Uh, the first is because if they would have taken this letter and just let everybody take it home, uh, it probably would have gotten torn up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> do you guys always take care of books that you get from the library? <laughs> so now we're talking about, you know, this ancient world, of, you know, it's going to get a lot more wear and tear on it. Um, and another thing is uh, illiteracy could be an issue in some in some places uh, where they weren't necessarily able to read it. Uh, and so they just kind of had it circulated among different churches where, like, these church leaders would read it aloud, then they'd kind of move it over here, and then they'd read it, and they'd just send it back. And so everybody kind of got a, got an idea. Uh, so let's say, for instance, the letter to the Ephesians. They go, oh, well, this is really good. Let's send it over to that church, and they can kind of learn from it and profit from it. Um, and that's how what we see historically from a lot of the different uh, books. Uh, normally, letters are broken up into a couple different sections, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. Um, they all pretty much follow this exact same format. In the introduction, you, you hit four different elements uh, in pretty much just... Well, and a lot of them. Uh, you typically have the writer, whoever is writing the letter. Uh, you have the recipients mentioned, not in all of the cases, um, but this is just the general idea of the letter. Uh, you have a greeting of some sort, and then you have a prayer. Um, the greeting can sometimes have a blessing in it. Uh, that kind of an idea. And... Um, and as you're going... You, 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 you can kind of, sometimes the introduction to, to letters are kind of ignored. But the thing is, if you really pay attention to it, you can ask these kinds of questions. Well, why did they choose to say what they did? You know, why are they saying this? And so you read the letter and you go back to the introduction. You can kind of see how they set up the rest of the book in the introduction. Uh, very interesting, um, the things that we skip over, I guess. Uh, the second section is called the body. Uh, the body really doesn't follow any single format. Like, so, in, for instance, in St. Corinthians, it follows a chiastic structure. Remember, we were talking about chiasm? It goes like this, and it has a central point, and it goes back, like a A, B, C, B, A. St. Corinthians follows that, but Galatians doesn't. Um, and then you have, you know, 1 Corinthians, which is kind of, I wrote this other letter, you guys misunderstood, so let me try again. <laughs> and, you know, so it has a lot of different sway there. But there's different things that are going to be normally apparent. Um, there's going to be some kind of a persuasion or correction or encouragement, uh, sometimes all of them. Uh, sometimes they're going to use different uh, encouragement to kind of persuade. <laughs> uh, Philippians, you can kind of see that the church was having some inner struggles. But Paul has a very joyous tone, very very light tone, a very encouraging tone. Um, but then you have Galatians where they're, you know, trying to become Jewish Christians and they receive a, a, sh a harsh reprimand from Paul. Uh, there's a lot of different, you can read a lot of books about ancient writing techniques and, and, and uh, kind of see how Paul used certain ancient arguments to write his letter. But I really didn't feel like it was worth mentioning in here because it kind of gets complicated and kind of convoluted and it would kind of drag the class out. Uh, but there are there are books out there if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, actually, uh, a good book that, that is real real easy to to you know wrap your head around uh, really helped me a lot um, with some of the more complicated ideas that scholars kind of argue back and forth about. It's called From Pentecost to Patmos. It's by Craig Blomberg. Um, if you're interested, it would be... It's a good source there. Moving on. Um, also in the body of most of the letters, they do reference uh, the culture quite frequently. Uh, in the book of, I think it's Jude, they actually mention some books that aren't in the Bible, and they quote them like almost authoritatively. This shouldn't really concern, like, bother you too much. Um, it, he's not saying that they belong in the Bible. He's just referencing a, 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 a pop culture, you know what I mean? Uh, thing like he says, uh, this event that happened where the angels were fighting over this body. Well, that wasn't in the Bible. Well, no, it wasn't in the Bible, but it was in this Jewish book, and his writers knew about that. So he can reference these things, and the writer would know. It'd be it'd be the similar situation of if I referenced Star Wars uh, and said, "Hey, you know, I am your father." You'd know what I was talking about more or less, uh, even if you haven't seen the movie. You probably at least know the reference. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that that is authoritative, but it's just a way of referencing it. The same thing happens in the New Testament. The third section is called the conclusion. Uh, these typically have uh, things that, once again, we oftentimes skip over, and I think that's a mistake. Things like travel plans or prayer requests, uh, or once again, I mentioned the autographs, where Paul says, this is the mark of my, uh, of my writing. So that takes us to the second type of books in the New Testament. They're called Gospels. Gospel means good news. Um, and the, the Gospels are not in order. They're not chronological. And in fact, they're usually topical. Um, so if you read through them, don't get it set, set in your head. This is how it happened. This is the order that it happened. B- because it probably isn't. Um, most, of the, most of the events, they just kind of move around. And once again, that shouldn't bother you because that, that is the way that they wrote back then. It, it, it doesn't claim to be a modern historical book where everything is in chronological order. A lot of people get really bent out of shape about that, but it is what it is. Um, they are also written very intentionally um, because, remember, they could have mentioned anything from Jesus' life, but they specifically chose these things. They did that for a reason. They didn't do it on accident. I think sometimes we fall into an error when we're reading the Bible, just kind of blowing through passages because, oh, I know this story, I know this. But we never stop and say, why is this author including this story in this place? Like, what is he getting at? What, is, what, am I, what can I learn from this? Um, so uh, there, is a, there is a writing style from in, back in this time, which is, I can just basically say is uh, ancient biography. And that's how it was written. Uh, when they did that, um, there was a strong focus on the death of the person that was being written about because to show someone's death was to show the real heart of the character. So if you look at the Gospels, they all have a really strong emphasis on his death. Um, yeah, I mean, think about this birth. There's only two that mention his birth. John doesn't even mention his birth. He goes to the pre-incarnate Christ and then hops forward to the John the Baptist and all this stuff. Uh, and then Mark pretty much just starts with, hey, John came as a fulfillment uh, to point the way to the Yahweh in flesh, which is Jesus. And here he is. Oh, <laughs> here he is. <laughs> Matthew and Luke are, Luke are the only ones who really slow down to take a look at, uh, at the settings. So uh, there's three, gosp- three of the four Gospels. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And three of them are called synoptics, which basically just means similar. There are three that are similar Gospels, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They follow a lot of the same stories, a lot of the same outline, generally speaking, and they're worded a lot similar. Uh, John is the oddball out. Uh, it was written much later uh, by the disciple John, who was one of Jesus' uh, closest disciples. And uh, tradition goes that he wrote it uh, shortly before his death. So this is obviously quite a u- number of years have passed. And um, it comes across in the writing style. If you read John and then you read Matthew, you're going to see that Jesus talks drastically different. And that's because nobody is really concerned about quoting uh, Jesus verbatim. The writing style of the ancient world was to more capture the essence of what they said, to really expand it and and keep, keep, keep true to what the person was trying to say, even if you don't say it exactly in the same way that they said it. And uh, that, that was a writing style that shouldn't alarm anybody. Uh, they, all the writers stayed true to what Jesus was saying, even if they do use their own words to say what he said. Um, just, once again, the way that they wrote back then. And in fact, if you compare John to the other Gospels, you're going to find sometimes it sounds like a completely different person. <laughs> That's because it was just worded by a different person. Um, the Gospels are not complete accounts. They do not tell us everything that happened in Jesus' life. Uh, they don't tell us a lot of different stages of Jesus' life. Uh, they just kind of skip a lot of things. Um, there's uh, there's a story in the in the uh, first or second century church. I don't remember exactly when uh, about Jesus when he was young and he traveled to Rome apparently and did all those things. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. It's it's more of a story. I don't know if it's accurate, but it's a story. Um, it, it didn't make it in the Bible, so either it wasn't true or uh, God didn't want us to worry too much about that. I don't know. Uh, but either way, it's, these the Gospels are not complete accounts. Um, they they are paraphrased while keeping the essence. I already mentioned that. Um, if you read through the Gospels, you're going to find some things that are apparently contradictions. It sounds like the Gospels are kind of contradicting themselves. Uh, that's more of because the different Gospels have different focuses or considerations. Um, it's not because there are there are contradictions. They just have different things that they're focusing on. Um, and I know I've said this example before, but it's worth mentioning again. Um, when the 
guy, the, the sick guy, is lowered in, through the roof of the house. Um, Luke says that he was that they took off the shingles of the house, and Matthew doesn't say anything about shingles. He said it was the um, I forget what the word is used, but it's that um, that hard stuff that were used in that was used in the Middle East. Well, the reason why Luke wrote that is because he's writing to a Greek audience where they use shingles. They didn't use that other stuff. See what I mean? So uh, was he? Well, which one is right? Because there can only be one, and it's a contradiction. Well, no, not really. It's just more of appropriating for the culture. It's not. You know, um, if I was if I was rewording the gospel and translating it to a tribe that didn't have uh, roofing materials whatsoever, I'd probably use a different word entirely, even though it wasn't accurate to what the Greek word was, because I'm trying to explain to them a gospel in their culture. See what I mean? So I would say more like maybe uh, he removed the branches and twigs from his from his roof, because maybe that's what they use there. See what I mean? It's not anything wrong. It's just uh, once again appropriating for the audience. And you find that kind of stuff a lot in the Gospels. Um, if you read, uh, two of the different Gospels have uh, the temptations of Jesus, but they're in different order. Um, once again, this is, not be- this is because they're not interested in chronology. <laughs> they're interested in topics. Um, and so. <clears throat> uh, they didn't think as precise as we would expect in modern days. Um, once again, that, that doesn't make it wrong. And now, in the Gospels, they aren't just telling a, uh, they aren't just telling a story. They're telling, very specifically, a personal story about Jesus. They are, they are telling something that is um, someone very close to them, something that is their entire life is, is revolving around. Um, it's not simply a story. Uh, th- there's a focus on his teachings. There's a focus on his works. But there, when, it, when it's written, this is not written just to be a objective uh paper about some guy that lived these people knew this guy and they were writing in a very personal way about this guy that they that they very much so cared about who was the founder of the church i mean this is kind of important um and it obviously comes across uh, once again there's a lot of ideas that the modern to to get um an accurate story you have to be objective and that's just not that's just not true there's a couple questions we need to ask when we go to the when we go to the gospels uh, the fir- first of the two, what is said about Jesus? What, what, do, what is this story or this account or whatever saying specifically about Jesus? And the same question, what is said by the stories put together? So like, here's a story about Jesus, here's a story about Jesus. Why are these two here? What, what are they trying to tell? And uh, when you're coming to an individual story uh, in, 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 in the Bible, an individual story like, hey, Jesus went and did this thing. You're going to want to ask four different questions as you go. The first, uh, find out find out all the all the typical uh, was it the the villains. I forget how how it's worded. The oh, there's a reference I'm I'm not making. But anyways, you know the 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 uh, that's going to bug me. Uh, the the how, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how, all that stuff. Uh, you know, find all those details out. And that kind of helps you narrow the focus because sometimes you read a story and just kind of blow through it. The second thing, does the author offer help? For instance, uh, I think it's in Luke, uh, he makes a comment, when Jesus saw this, he told this parable. So right there, the author is helping you out. This parable is going to have something to do with what Jesus just saw. He's kind of giving you signals. Um, The third thing to ask, is anything repeated in the story? Read through the parables or read through the different parts and say, okay, so what is being repeated? And why is there such an emphasis being placed on this? What is he trying to get at? The fourth thing, notice when the story shifts to direct speech. Okay, there, there's a count, I believe it's in Mark, where he's talking about um, how he goes to the other side of the, of the river, I mean, sorry, of the lake, and there's a storm starts going, and the disciples kind of freak out, and they're like, don't you care? Oh, no, 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 I'm thinking of the wrong story. Uh, Jesus is asleep on the boat, and he says, uh, they wake him up, and they say, don't you care that we're drowning? Well, the story is going, and it keeps making these little diversions to direct speech. So, you, okay, this is what's happening. He specifically said this. And if you t- take just those direct speeches, you kind of get a, a synopsis of the story without reading the story. And sometimes when you pay attention to those uh, shifts between direct speech and story, it kind of helps you to summarize. It helps you to kind of grasp the main idea more. And it oftentimes can be um, can give little signals and, and hints uh, to meanings of what he's trying to get at. 
so the next thing is when th that's more for an individual story though. So remember in the Gospels, the stories aren't arranged chron chronologically; they're arranged topically. So he'll have two different stories next to each other, and you want to always go to those kinds of uh, kinds of things in the, in the Gospels with this question. Okay, so how is this connecting with this? So we're analyzing more of the series of stories more than just the individual story. So question number one, or comment number one, whatever you want to say. Look for connections or themes between the two stories. You've got, okay, he did this, and then he did this. Well, what's the connection? I don't, I, don't, I don't get the way. These things don't seem to have anything in common. And so find the connection between them. And the second thing, notice little breaks. <coughs> so Mark, does anybody have a paper Bible with them? Can you turn to Mark 4.1? Watch. This is a great example of, of uh, breaks. 4.1. Okay, now hop all the way down to verses 33 through 34. Did you, see, did you guys catch the break? Mark 4 opens up. Okay, there's a great crowd. He gets in the boat. He starts telling parables. And then, verses 33 through 34, it gives us a little signal. Hey, what happens in chapter 5 is not related to this. I'm closing off this section. And he says it like this. In this way, he spoke many parables. I'm not recording every single parable that, I, that he said. I'm just simply telling you these parables were all connected. I've connected them for you. There's a theme here. Now we're going to move on. And after, when you get to get to the next verse, you see that the theme changes. So you don't want to see, you don't want to look at, for a connection between what's after verse 34 with what's before verse 34. You want to find a connection between verses 1 to verses 34. In that section, there's going to be stories that are told that are connected with each other. And so those little breaks, and that's what I mean by look for the breaks. Well, look for in the Gospels when it specifically draws attention to, hey, there's a break here. It's closing. And uh, because w what happens sometimes is you try to connect to stories that aren't related, and the author's trying to tell you that they're not related. And that's a great example uh, in verse 33 through 34 about how he's saying these stories are no longer related with those stories. So uh, Jesus' miracles are definitely previews of a new age. Um, the things recorded in the New Testament, they're great, but that's not the end of the story. We're looking forward to a day, you know, when these things are going to be not just normative, but not even needed. When, when we won't need healing, because we'll have the resurrected body with the new heavens and new earth. Everything that Jesus did uh, is very much so um, uh, previews of the new age. When, so let's say, for instance, somebody was sick in the Gospels. Jesus healed them. You know they still died later? We pray for people. We get upset when they don't get healed. They're going to die anyways. You, you we blind ourselves to that, like, oh, why didn't God answer my prayer? They're going to die. Okay, it's just a matter of when. Like, you can't hide from that. That's a, that's a, that's a pain that we have to endure. Uh, my generation is, is real real low on facing the reality of life. <laughs> they, they, they just want to kind of have all the joy of life without any of the pain. And it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, and we, we see here with Jesus, you know, yes, there were some people that he healed, but he didn't heal every single person in the whole world. He didn't heal everybody. Same as now. He doesn't heal everybody. You know, Jesus still does heal people. The Holy Spirit is active. However, <laughs> not every prayer that, you, prayer that you pray is going to be answered. Just like it wasn't answered when Jesus Christ was himself was walking on the earth. So, you know, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foretaste of the new age is coming. Um, but it's not the finished of the story. Um, the Bible even says that prophecies will cease. In, in Corinthians, it mentions the way that you know all these all these all these prophecies they're going to stop. They're, they're they're for a limited time only. <laughs> and once we get in heaven, there's not going to be a need for prophecy, so those things are going to cease. Um, so when applying though the gospels, uh, pay pay attention to the bigger context of the book as a whole, uh, and also the other gospels too. I mean, um, there was this uh, effort. Uh, I want to say it's sometime around 1080. Don't I'm not really sure about that. Sometime around 1000 AD, when they wanted to take the Gospels and make one single Gospel, 
They, they said, well, there's just too many differences, so let's just kind of unite them into one thing. And uh, one of the things that, that came from it is the, the realization that, no, these were written as four different views, uh, pictures, if you will, of Jesus. And they're all right, they're all good, and they need to keep their uniqueness. Uh, we don't need to try and make one uh, edited version. We need to keep them as these four uh, four Gospels. They were written with their own points. So Jesus uses a number of techniques uh, in his preaching style. He was not a very boring teacher. <laughs> uh, he, yeah, he really uh, did a lot of stuff that caused people to think. Um, I just love the way that he interacts with people. Um, there's this one time when the Pharisees are trying to, uh, trying to basically, you know, get him in, get him in a corner, back him in a corner, and he says, "Okay, uh, you answer my question, I'll answer your question." And they, he asks them this question, and they all go, "Oh, if we say this, he's going to say that. And if we say this, he's going to say that." So they say, uh, "I don't know." And then Jesus says, "Yeah." And in the same way, I'm not going to answer you either. Like this is a guy that that that. <laughs> He just had such a such a unique way of teaching. I, I wish that uh, we could, you know, recover some of that and and preach in the same way. But anyways, uh, the first technique that Jesus used is called exaggeration. Um, this is very important to, to note because a lot of times people think that in order for me to stay true to Jesus and his teachings, I had to take everything literally, and that's just not true. Uh, Matthew five. Uh, 29 is a great example of this. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away, for it is better to... He's not literally telling people to pluck out their eyeballs. Okay, this is, this is, he's drawing... It's an extreme example of something. It's an exaggeration. It's a, it's, a, it's a type of teaching where you know, you're really drawing attention to something. So exaggeration. And the Gospels are full of that. So if you're going to look for every single thing to be literal you're going to probably dis- be disappointed with the Gospels. Uh, the second thing is uh, metaphors and similes. I just kind of included them together uh, because it's really hard to remember the difference between metaphor and simile. So a simile is basically um, this is like that, and metaphor is basically this is that. So, okay, here's a good example. Uh, um, my son is a, uh, is a parrot. That's a metaphor. My son is. Let me hang on another second. Hold on. Let me read that. My son is is like. Uh, I can't think of something right now, but uh, you get the idea. So, more of the story being, there's metaphors and similes in the Bible. Some some good examples of this would be, um, okay, here here, some biblical examples for you. Uh, Christians are the salt of the world. Okay. This is this is good, okay? Uh, and then it says in other, uh, other place, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, this is in Matthew. Jer- Jerusalem, Jerusalem, oh, how I long to, to gather you as a hen gathers her, her chicks. So this would be a good example of the, of the two, metaphors and similes. Uh, and when there are metaphors, don't push them too far. Sometimes we can kind of really try to drag out every little detail. Yeah, that's a huge mistake. It's trying to get a, point, get a basic point across. Don't push it too far where it's not really even what it's trying to say anymore. Um, and we do this with like hyper super spiritualism. Like, I've been super faithful to the Bible, so I'm really going to push it for all it's worth. When he said he's like a hen, that's because he's going to... Uh, come down over Jerusalem at the end and he's going to... No, that's... No, it's just simply talking about the way that Jesus desires to protect and to save and they just won't have it. It's, 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 it, it. That's the meaning he's trying to get across. Just leave it there. You don't have to make something super spiritual. And uh, anyways, another thing about metaphors and similes, uh, they usually compare two things that are that are pretty different things like Christians and salt... <laughs> Christians are people, and salt is, you know, a mineral, or, you know, whatever you want to say there. Uh, and so when you're reading a metaphor, always ask the question, what is the point of this metaphor? The next thing is irony. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of metaf- of irony, and, and I'll save you the boring lecture from an English class and just say, uh, irony is what is expected versus what happens. And that's a real basic definition, but it's, it gets the point across. Um, so, okay. Um, here's a good one. Jesus says, hey, if you want to live, you have to die. 
Well, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> I was expecting if I wanted to live that I need to do all these things. And we kind of lose irony um, because we lose it to familiarity. If I know a story well enough, I'm not going to really be attentive to the irony in the story. And uh, that's a, a bad place to be in. But um, there's a story, this parable that Jesus tells about this, this farmer. And it, it's a great example of irony. It says that he had such a great crop that he said, hey... I'm going to build myself another storage because of all this increase I've got. So we're all with him. We're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. You're being responsible. You're, hey, this is, this is a good thing. And then, and then Jesus interrupts the story with this. You foolish servant, didn't you know this very night your life is demanded from you? What? Like that's a good example of irony. It's the exact opposite thing that you expect. You expect that Jesus is going to say, hey, well done. You know, you really thought ahead. But instead, Jesus gives him a reprimand. So uh, it's what's expected versus what actually happened. Um, rhetorical questions uh, are a lot simpler than a lot of people make them. They're basically questions that don't need an answer, uh, questions where the answer is assumed. Um, and if you read a, a, a rhetorical question, a good practice to help you understand what's being said, because um, sometimes it can get a little bit confusing, is if you just kind of restate it as a statement, So, um, uh, what then, Paul from Romans, what then? Should we go on sinning? Re rephrase that. Now, we know we shouldn't go on sinning. So I'm, I'm turning it from a question into a statement, and if that helps you to get what's, what's being said, then, hey, whatever works for you. Um, uh, let's see. A good example of this is Luke 12:51. Uh, Melissa, would you mind turning in there? Twelve fifty one, yeah. Right there. Stop right there. Do you think that I that I thought to bring peace on earth? That's the rhetorical question. The, the answer is no. I I didn't come to bring peace on earth. So you could rephrase it like this. I did not come to bring peace on earth. So uh just as long as you get the point that's being made, it, that that's what I'm getting at. Uh, next up is parallelism. This is where two or more lines read together to develop a thought. Uh you want to read uh uh, Matthew 7, 7. This is a very familiar passage. I'm sure all you guys remember it. You know, it's ask, seek, and knock. But just pay attention to the way that it's basically the same idea in three different ways. Oh, whenever. So this, this is a good example of parallelism. You see the same kind of idea, you know, three different times. Um, the, kind of, the two or more lines that you read them together. It's important that you don't separate when there's parallelism, don't separate them. Um, because what's going to happen is you're going to try and find deeper meanings in every line when it's, it's a poetical style of, of getting a point across. So if you try and separate them into three different thoughts, you're going to lead yourself astray. It's, it's one thought, and you re read them together as one thought. Uh, and that's kind of the biggest issue with parallelism. The next up is parables. Now, parables are probably some of the most uh, difficult uh, things in the Gospels because people aren't sure what to do with a parable. And that's what it comes down to. A parable is basically a story that teaches a lesson. It's very important to remember that parables are not allegories. In an allegory, everything stands for something. Okay, So like, everybody knows the story of the uh, prodigal son. Well, so then the fattened calf has to mean something. It has to stand for something. Uh, the the The... The pig, the pig's food has to stand for something. The, uh, the, the place where the sun gets the job at. All this stuff has to get, has to have its own meaning. Parables don't work like that. Parables say, here is a setting. I'm drawing you a can. Here's a canvas. Okay, uh, I'm not drawing you a canvas. This is the canvas. And I am drawing some things on that canvas. So as it applies to, well, I'll tell you that in just a second. But um, with parables, you want to look for two things. First off. There is one main point per main character or characters. Sometimes there'll be a, a main character will be a group of people. They'll kind of function together. And the second thing about parables, um, ma the main point has to be what the original audience would have understood. You you can't kind of bring your own thing to the table. It has to be something that was there. So let's go back to the story of the prodigal son. This is this is a parable. Long story short here. 
Uh, Guy has two sons. One of his sons demands his inheritance so he can go and squander it. He does that, ends up poor. Then he says, you know, what am I doing? I could at least get a job for my father and live better than this. Uh, so he goes, and he's about to, about to apologize to his father. His father cuts him off, welcomes him back with a great feast. That's a basic summary of the story. Well, in the ancient world, <laughs> you don't do that to your dad. <laughs> like, for, to ask for your inheritance is basically to wish him death. Like that's just that's something you did not do in the ancient world. This is a very big no-no, and so I'm sure Jesus' hearers would have been like, <gasps> like the story of the uh, of the Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan. We don't think twice about it, but back in his day, people had Jews hated Samaritans. So you have this 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 villain that nobody likes, and he's the hero of the story, and uh, you know just stuff like that. Uh, where, where the in, in parables, so there's going to be d- different characters. And those different characters carry a main point. So the father, that would be one main character. The son, that would be a second main character. And the other son would be a second main character. So how many points does the parable of the prodigal son have? Three points. The first point, the faithfulness of the father and the long-suffering of the father. That's what the parable of the prodigal son is about. It's about the father. Second thing it's about, someone who has left, left the faith, not someone in the world, someone who has left the faith, and is coming back to the faith. Second main point. Third main point. The one who never left and gets angry at the Father's mercy and compassion. Three separate main points. And that's how you take parables at. So whenever you're going through a parable, separate them like that. Find your main characters, and then say, okay, so from this perspective, what is the main point from this main character's perspective? Okay, now switching over here, and you do that, and you can kind of, you know, it's it's more or less um, easy to figure out. Uh, think of um, the story, the parable of the woman who's cleaning the house for the coin. It's got one, one person, one point, and uh, so that's kind of, if that helps, great. That takes us to the Acts uh, of the uh, of the apostles. Um, Acts is a sequel book. It was written by the same guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke, and it was written for the same uh, person. Uh, this guy's name was Theophilus, uh, you know, once again a Greek man. And so Luke wrote these two books. It was probably fun- a project funded by this guy named Theophilus. We have no idea anything about him. Uh, <laughs> but for Luke to draw so much attention to him at the beginning of both books argues that he was the... Um, the guy funding the project. So, anyways, uh, in, 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 in Luke, he, he goes and details everything to give a historical account of Jesus. And in Acts, he, gives, he goes to basically give us an establishment manual to, to, to accurately record what happened as the church um, grew out. It's a sequel to Luke, and it details the spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the world. It starts out with Jesus saying, go to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and all that. And the rest of the book follows that same format. It starts in Jerusalem, then goes out to Samaria, to Samaria, and then it goes out further into Rome. The book ends in Rome, and it begins in Jerusalem. So the, the statement by Jesus that you will go out and be my disciples to the end of the world, that's, that tells us right then what the format of the book of Acts is going to be. Um, so you're reading through it, and uh, there are some things that, that are very, um, uh, very forefront, uh, the move of the Spirit is the, the Holy Spirit is, is one of those front and center things. Um, throughout the book, you're reading and you see that it's not just the gospel going; it's also the Spirit going. You see Jews getting filled with the Holy Spirit, then you see Samaritans getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you see Romans and, and all these other people being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's one of these things that's spreading out. Uh, it's classified more as a theological history. It's not necessarily interested in just giving us blind facts. It's more focused on uh, teaching us things with facts. Uh, it's also not verbatim. You can know this <laughs> in a lot of parts, but it says, you know, uh, one part is mentioned that, P- <clears throat> that Peter preached all day, and he didn't end until the evening. And it says that in the story, but we have a sermon that's 15 verses long. I don't know how, slong, how slow of a talker Peter was, but the chances of him taking 15 verses to preach that long are kind of small. Um, and once again, because Luke wasn't interested, he wasn't even there for half the things. He wasn't interested in giving verbatim every single word that was uttered. He's just kind of giving the highlight. This is what Peter's sermon was about. I'm giving you the shortened version. Okay, And uh, and then he moves on, and he does this quite quite a lot. 
Um, it's, it's very focused on speeches in the book. Um, the first half is about Peter. The second half is about Paul. Peter as the progenitor, or whatever you want to say, to the Jews, and Paul is to the uh, Greeks or to the Gentiles. And uh, so it has this breakdown here. You have Acts is basically a contrast between Peter and Paul. Not as a, I shouldn't say contrast, um, because it's not negative. It's not saying one's less legit than the other one. Uh, but it's basically, you know, these two main characters where it shifts between the two of them and goes like that. So, anyways, uh, moving on. What else is there to say about this? Uh, Acts is written to show this, how the Spirit empowers the church to take the gospel to the world. That's its its main uh, focus. Um, a lot of times we say, "Well, I don't. I, I'm just not real good with uh, you know talking to people and telling them about Jesus and that kind of stuff." Sometimes the issue is that we need the Holy Spirit, <laughs> and we try to bluff our way through the situation without the Holy Spirit. And I don't think God really intended for us to do that. Some main themes are in the Book of Acts: uh, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, obviously. Uh, the church, prayer, suffering, Gentiles, witnessing. These are kind of main focus uh, focuses in the book. And um, if you take it all together, you basically have the book of Acts as a discipleship manual. Uh, this is some, to written to somebody who's a new Christian, trying to teach them about the ways of being a Christian, the way that the church grows and that kind of stuff. So um, it has a similar approach to the Gospels when you're reading it, so you're going to want to do a lot of the same things. Hey, what is the main message of this episode? Excuse me. Uh, and then as you as you look at that, how do the episodes connect? Why are these things being clarified? And you have quite a number of years between the point that Paul is saved and the point that he goes to his first missionary journey. And a lot of that skipped over. Question being, you know, why? Uh, so you also want to ask the same who, what, why questions. Very helpful. Uh, this, is, this is something we'll get more into the Old Testament, but I do still need to mention it here. The stories in Acts are partially normative, partially descriptive. Okay? Partly normative, partly descriptive. What I mean by that is that not everything that's recorded in the book of Acts is meant for us to continue on forever. But then there are some things that are in the, in the book of Acts which are meant for us to repeat. I'll give you a real quick example. Uh, there's this part where I believe it's a shadow um, falls on people and they're and they're healed by going in the shadow. I think if I remember correctly, maybe it was a uh, Kleenex or no, it wasn't a Kleenex. I, mean, I think it was a shadow if I remember correctly. And that's not normative. Like that's not it's not something where every Christian who gets saved and filled with the Holy Spirit they're going to walk past people and their shadows are going to heal people. That's not a normative thing. That's simply describing what did happen. Um, Genesis does this when it mentions how people got more than one wife. It's not saying, hey, go and do likewise. It's saying this guy had more than one wife. It's descriptive. Just because it's describing something doesn't mean it's teaching something. And there's a few ways to kind of tell, uh, you know, when it... Man, this fly won't leave me alone. Uh, there's a few ways to kind of tell. Um, it kind of gets a little bit complicated. Even I have a hard time where I have to sit and, sit and think about things. Sometimes it seems like common sense, but the problem is, is that I know a lot of people who've read the book of uh, the book of Acts and said, "Yeah, well, the move of the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit that, that's not normative; that's descriptive." So it's like, well, maybe it isn't common sense. Uh, and so I would say there, there's kind of like four really quick things. First off, what was intended? Is this trying to describe something that should carry on for eternity? Uh, is this something that you, you kind of have to pay attention to the story itself? The same thing, is it a negative example? Like, for instance, um, Ananias and Sapphira, they try to lie uh, to the church, and the Holy Spirit decides to kill them. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't kill everybody who lies <laughs> to the church. Um, and then in fact, in the book of Acts, we only have this one example of that happening. Um, but anyways, uh, a little side note I want to mention. If you, if you read something in the Bible and, and you think it's teaching you something, See if there's at least three examples of that happening in the Bible before you establish doctrine. Okay, Because sometimes what we do is we, we read one story, and we don't understand what's happening. So then we say, this is always the case. And it's like, well, I know it happened that one time. Uh, maybe wait and see. Like there, There's some things that this is obviously not going to really matter. I'm like, hey, Jesus died for sinners. Okay, that's, that's not something they really have to dispute that much. But if, if somebody says something about the Bible or Christianity and just kind of tries to teach a doctrine that just kind of seems off the wall and doesn't really settle in your spirit, 
go to the Bible and just kind of see what the Bible says about it. Because sometimes they don't understand a story and they just kind of jerk it off. Anyways, so going back to this, uh, the third thing about, uh, about finding if it's uh, normative or descriptive, what do other passages or books of the Bible say about it? Is this something that is talked about in other areas? And then the last thing, uh, is it a regular occurrence in the book of Acts or is it not? So for example this, preaching in the book of Acts is a normative thing. It happens all throughout the book. But, uh, and preaching with boldness is. Um, and I already mentioned the way that being healed by a shadow, that only happens in one spot. Uh, at the beginning of the book, they want to find out what God's will is, so they cast lots, like the Jews used to do. But that's the only time in the entire book that it happens. The rest of the time, it's, and then the Spirit led them here, and then the Spirit led them here. And you don't hear them talk about casting lots at all. Well, what's the difference? Well, before, in the beginning of the book, when they're casting lots, the Holy Spirit had not been given to the church. And then afterwards, it had. So that tells me that the giving of the Holy Spirit somehow negated the casting of lots from the Old Testament. That's what my understanding is. I, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm open to discussing that one. Uh, that takes us to Revelation, the last of the sections of the New Testament. So we've looked at all the different parts of the New Testament tonight. And we've kind of broken it up into sections. And I, hopefully th this will really set you on the right course. If you're having a problem with a book, uh, a sp specific book of the Bible, take these different things we've been looking at. And take these clues that I've given you and just go and study and give it time. If you don't understand it in a day or two, don't worry about it. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Give it two or three weeks. You still don't understand it, maybe ask for help. So I mean, it's one of those things where, where you, you got to uh, put forth the time and effort, but it is still going to not necessarily come naturally. Um, so then the last uh, book of the New Testament is probably the most confusing book of the entire Bible. Uh, it's called Revelation um, oh, boy, oh, boy. And the idea of Revelation is the church is kind of wondering, the, the, these persecuted Christians who are having to go through a lot of junk, they're kind of wondering, what's taking so long? We believe, we've been standing in faith, and Jesus still is not here. What's taking so long? Which is kind of, <laughs> kind of funny, because they hadn't even made it 100 years after Jesus died, and here we are 2,000 years <laughs> later, <laughs> So it's, you know, I guess that the uh, long story short, they needed to learn how to hurry up and wait. Um, and the idea of revelations is to give hope to suffering Christians. I know you hear it talked about a lot nowadays as a means to scare people into salvation. But if you get people saved through scaring them, you're going to have to keep them saved through scaring them. If you get people saved by the gospel of grace, then that's how they'll, be, they'll continue being saved. Whatever saves people is whatever they need to keep them saved. So if you make it a practice of just trying to scare people into salvation, I mean, it sounds like a good idea at the time, but it kind of backfires because then they're operating not out of grace, but out of fear. They're, they're scared. It's not because the Holy Spirit did something. It's not because they experienced God or anything like that. It's just because they experienced fear, and they don't want that. So then they'll go the rest of their life, usually, in a lot of cases I've talked to, or just lead the church, of being terrified uh, of panic attacks and, and nightmares and all that. That's not really the point of the gospel. So uh, it's to give hope, not, not, not to scare people. Uh, the basic outline of Revelation goes present. In the beginning, it's talking about the, chap the, the churches of Revelation. Uh, and then it goes to the near future, things that, are, things that are happening right around there, a little bit in the future, a couple of years in the future. And then it goes to the far distant future. And it just kind of skips around a lot. Uh, and then there's an issue that uh, Revelation isn't necessarily um, uh, written in order either. So it, just because it follows that general outline doesn't mean that something mentioned in chapter 17 or something might have been before or after chapter 12. You don't know. It's one of those, it's just kind of broken up. Uh, the best approach for Revelations is to just approach it humbly. Don't approach it, approach it thinking that you know everything. Really, this is, a, this is a book that demands respect and, and humility when you approach it, uh, especially there's a lot of uh, teachers that just kind of use it as a launching pad to go into some dark, weird places. Um, it's a little bit prophetic, and it's a little bit apocalyptic. Those two things are not the same. Um, apocalyptic literature is a writing style, and Revelation is the only New Testament book that is written in that style. 
Um, in the Old Testament, there are, I think, believe, two spots, maybe three, that are written in, in as apocalyptic literature. Daniel, Ezekiel. There is a small section in Isaiah, and there might be a section in Jeremiah. Maybe one or two of the minor prophets. But by and large, apocalyptic literature isn't something that's just overflowing in the Bible. It's, it's probably the smallest genre in the Bible. And so prophecy does two things. It uh, foretells and it foretells. So basically, hey, you're living in sin. That's pro- part of, half of what prophecy does. Another thing prophecy does is it says what's happening in the future. Um, with apocalypse, it more describes... <sighs> It's just a different writing style, and you have to take it not as literally as prophecy. That's, that's the easiest way I can say this. Prophecy is going to be more literal. Hey, in five years, there's going to be a famine. Apocalyptic literature more has a lot of imager, imagery and symbolism and metaphors. Okay, so like if you read through Revelation, there's a dragon. There's all this stuff happening. There's a woman that lays on seven hills, and there's all this stuff. And you're like, what is going on here? This is a very large woman, and she's going to lay down on seven hills. Hills. Well, that's Rome. Rome was built on seven hills. It's described as a woman, and the woman's laying on seven hills. It's, it's talking about the city of Rome. Uh, and so that's a good example of prophecy, I mean, of apocalyptic literature. If it was written as prophecy, it would say, the city of Rome will. Say what I mean. So those are the two different writing styles. And, uh, okay, uh, as I mentioned, you really have to keep it humble when you're approaching Revelation. Um, and whenever you're reading it, try to keep the original intent in mind. Uh, you can really, because Revela- Revelations is written unlike any other book, you can really jerk it around, you know. And um, with Re- with Revelation, it's best to go to everything assuming that it's not literal, unless it specifically says that it is literal. That's the exact opposite of how you should approach, you know, most of the other <laughs> most of the other parts of the Bible. Um, it's kind of the the exception to the rule. Uh, don't try to make a strict map of Revelation like this is the way that the end times will go. It, it, that's it's you're probably going to be wrong anyways. It just you'll know in the end if you were right or wrong. <laughs> and uh, but definitely take take Revelation seriously, but not always literally. Revelation serious, yes, absolutely. Just don't take it always literally. Um, I already mentioned the the thing about the woman on the seven hills. If you take that literally, you're going to be set with well, like I said, a very large woman. It's not you're going to miss the point. Um, <clears throat> pay attention to images that are identified in the story. So, like for instance, it'll say that there's there were these lampstands, and then it'll describe what those lampstands were. But then maybe in another part it'll describe how there was a star, and that doesn't mean that it's the same light as this other part. So you've got to pay attention to it, does it clarify what's what something is and uh then whenever you're reading through revelation remember that uh, it's got a historical context so you want to kind of what what's going on back then and then the second thing is is it really has a lot of old testament in fact revelation has 70 percent of its verses are old testament references 70% 70% of the verses in Revelation are Old Testament references. So if you don't know the Old Testament, it's going to be totally crazy off the wall stuff. Um, it references Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel very, very strongly. And uh, so if you're having problems with, with Revelation, maybe start with the Old Testament and then move forward from there. Um, as far as when you're reading Revelation, you're probably going to get lost in a lot of the details. It's going to be very confusing um, do this, and this is a, a great a great rule of thumb. Just kind of take a step back, and instead of trying to interpret every single thing in the chapter, focus on the main idea and don't get lost in the details. Okay, pretend like you're driving past something really fast, and you're just getting like a real quick kind of look at it. That'll kind of help you to get the main idea instead of getting lost in all the details. Because what we do is we read Revelation, and I have no idea what's going on. So either we stop. Or, or we make something up. Either way, we're just not really grasping it. If you kind of step back, don't worry about the details, and focus on the main idea, you'll get it. Uh, Revelation 12 is a great example of this, and this is where we're going to stop for tonight. Uh, there's a, Revelation 12 starts up real strong with this, this story about this woman who's giving, about to give birth. 
and this dragon comes and is trying to trying to devour this child that's born. Well, the woman gets taken away and and she's kind of held and in, 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 you know safe safe over there, and uh, the dragon's trying to trying to you know destroy things. Well, this this child gets taken up into heaven, and the 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 dragon gets very upset, so he tries to rage against things, and he get, ends up getting cast out of heaven. So he's going around raging around the earth, uh, just basically trying to make everybody's life unpleasant. Well. The idea there is the woman is is Israel, and Jesus is is, is the child. And uh, you know, the, Satan tried to destroy what Jesus was doing. It didn't work. He got very upset about it, uh, and so that is a reason why we are in so much pain and suffering. Is because Satan has lost. He's upset. He's irritated, and he's taking it out on us. Um, now, obviously, I could go more in depth, but I'm just trying to give you the basic idea. If you kind of take a step back, focus on the main idea, it's kind of a lot easier to see uh, what's happening in the story. But like I said, always approach Revelation with humility. You could definitely be wrong. The guy that you're watching on TV, he could be wrong. I could be wrong. The book that you're reading could be wrong about it. Just approach it with hum- with humility. Don't go to it and say, I've got it figured out. Uh, because if there's anything I know for sure, pride comes before a fall. And uh, it, it's a very complicated book. It's a very confusing book. Um, I know there's a good part of Daniel that's the exact same way. It's just like, I, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> I, I'm trying. I really am, but I just don't get it. And, you know, here's the thing. That's okay. Because the, old, the people who wrote the Bible and prophesied and all that, they didn't always understand the message they gave either. There is an element of the Bible that will be a mystery to you. That's okay. Because there's going to be a large majority of it that the Holy Spirit will speak to you through. So if you just kind of focus on the parts where, where you're getting it, and as you grow and mature, God will show you more when you're ready for it. There's going to be some things that you're reading, oh, that's interesting, but then it'll hit you different in five years than it does now. You know what I mean? Uh, that's happened to me countless times. And that's kind of just the way that the Bible works. So you can get the main idea of Revelation without always understanding every single bit of it. You know what I mean? And that's kind of what I'm getting at is is just because you can't understand every little detail of it don't get mad just kind of okay well what can i get from this book and that's a good place to start with are there any questions next week is our last week guys so if you have questions like this is this is the time (laughs) uh we'll be looking at i'll break down the old testament just like i did the new testament but we will not be spending 15 minutes of our lesson (laughs) talking about uh, very rushly talking about something that i missed from last week uh so everybody good Okay.